ahead and start the recording and we'll get started. So thank you so much for joining uh, today's dehydrating class. Um, we're gonna be talking about dehydrating different foods, leathers and jerkies. Uh, my name is Amber Webb. I'm the Family Consumer Sciences Extension Agent for Larimer County. Um, I have a background in nutrition and food science um, and I specialize in the food preservation classes. This is really such a fun time of year because this is when my classes are in full swing. So we do classes in person and then also uh, through our uh, our virtual workshops. And I have a few left. I've got a pickling class, a pressure canning class, and a sauerkraut class. And those are all so much fun. So if you're interested in taking a look at those, I would love to have you join us. So when I talk about dehydrating, really the dehydrating process is pretty straightforward. We are going to be talking about the removal of water so that microorganisms can't grow and spoil the food. It really is as simple as that. Um, and you'll see both drying and dehydration, both of those words um, in uh, throughout the presentation. They really, they mean the same thing. Um, and then when you're ready to eat the foods, you are going to be rehydrating or reconstituting if you're using it for purposes such as cooking. And that's really just returning water to dried foods. And then with that, in order to do that, we have to control the temperature and the air circulation while we're dehydrating so that we're preventing food from spoiling during that process. And there's a few different ways we can do that. Now, someone already said they're here for ways to use dehydrated food for camping and backpacking. It's just fantastic. Um, one of my favorite things to dehydrate, actually, we're getting into the season, is apples and pears. And I just keep those with me all the time when I'm out and about. I have a toddler that loves uh, dehydrated fruit, and it's just such a fantastic snack. It's lightweight, doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, it's really great for that. So, but you can also use ingredients for things like soups and stews um, and casseroles. So one of the examples that I had last night in class was dehydrated uh, potatoes, uh, thin sliced dehydrated potatoes. You can keep those for quite a long time and then reconstitute those and use those as uh, like a recipe for things like scalloped potatoes is what one of my examples from my master of food safety advisors uses hers for. But you can also think about doing things like making vegetable flakes or powders for seasoning. So um, I've seen folks that will dehydrate onions and then grind those up and use it as onion powder. Um, it's definitely not the best smelling process in your house like dried apples would be, um, but it's certainly worth it if you have a lot of that, um, that vegetable uh, available to you. Um, I just showed you uh, a few different examples of the foods that I had, but things like tomatoes, um, you can use these for all different kinds of flavorings, um, for pizza, for soups and stews. You can add it for um, uh, putting a little bit more umami in your, in your cooking. But also, if you were to dehydrate these and then grind it down, you can use it as a, as a flake as well. Um, they're just so, so delicious, those sun-dried tomatoes. Okay, if you've got any other tips that anyone is here that you would love to share, please put it in the chat and uh, share that information with others. Okay. So there are multiple methods for dehydrating foods. We don't, we're not gonna have the time to cover everything today, but we are gonna talk about three different methods. That's electric dehydrating, oven dehydrating, and air drying. Now, there are two different kinds of dehydrator designs. Now, you can see here on the left, you've got the horizontal dehydrator, and then you've got on the right, the vertical dehydrator. Now, they're both a little bit different, and we're gonna talk through those differences, but with that, uh, in both of these models, you will have a, a thermostat that gives you temper, temperature control anywhere from 85 all the way to 165 actually on, uh, on my model that I have been using recently. And I'm not seeing variation much beyond that. So when you're choosing a dehydrator, you wanna make sure that you have easy to clean trays that provide really great air circulation, um, a liner for fruit leather, um, I'll be talking about that a little bit more, a fan or a blower for air circulation, and then expandable models that give you more drying space. Now I'm gonna go back to this last photo just to kind of talk you through that a little bit more. 
there are some advantages to the different kinds of models. So the horizontal one, you can see how those trays slide out. So you can use as little or as many trays as that unit will allow, um, but it'll all still be in that one large container. I'm thinking this is an Excalibur model. I have one of these at, um, at my work. Um, they are fantastic. They've got that adjustable thermostat, but they also have that timer. You might or might not know dehydrating food can take significant amount of time. So depending on what you're doing, anywhere between four and maybe 10 hours or longer. And if you've got that project going, maybe you start it in the evening and you want to do it overnight, or you want to start it in the morning on a weekend and you're in and out all day long. If you have a timer on it, it'll stop when it needs to stop. And then it's not going to be continuing on. And you're having to think about, you know, your food overcooking potentially. What's also great about this model is that it's not just for dehydrating. You can pull all of those trays out and you can use it for things like um, proofing bread and also making yogurt uh, because yogurt has a very specific uh, temperature that you need to um, let that do its fermentation process in. So that's kind of a fun one. In addition to that, this model can also, it claims that it's better for using different kinds of foods um, and those foods not flavoring each other because the air is moving in one direction versus the vertical one, that airflow is getting sucked up through the center, getting heated up at the bottom, and then continually going around the edge of that tray. So you can see on this one on the right, there are holes around the outside rim, um, and that is where that airflow um, goes goes around it and then you've got the obviously the trays themselves but it's been said that the horizontal or excuse me the vertical the up and down can affect flavors um, a little bit more than this other model I have not specifically experienced that other people may have but I am careful not to mix really strong flavors so for instance I'll put a couple different kinds of fruit or a couple different kinds of vegetables or maybe even together in one batch, but I may not mix produce and jerky at the same time. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful in uh, delineating those differences. Okay. Now with oven drying, this is also something that is absolutely available to you because it's something that you already have in your house, right? But we were just talking um, with someone earlier today and they were saying uh, it's, you know, ovens are different these days. What you need for most dehydrating projects is about 145 degrees or so. Um, so you need to consider if your oven is capable of that temperature range. Um, but Oven dehydrating can take two or three times longer than an electric dehydrator. And if you're already using your dehydrator for five or 10 hours at a time, think about how long that oven needs to be in use um, where you're not gonna be able to use it for anything else. You do need to rotate and turn your food and the food is usually darker, it's a little more brittle and some people claim that it's less flavorful than a dehydrator. If this is your only option, if you have a lot that you'd like to do and you wanna try it out, absolutely do give it a try. Just kind of, just be aware that there are some things that you need to consider when you're doing that. So in addition to using that appropriate temperature, uh, you need to be able to open up your door for two to four inches for air circulation. So you need to be able to prop it open a little bit. And then if you can use a fan outside of it to circulate air, um, that's a really great, um, uh, an additional method to make sure that you have a high quality product. Now, there are so many things that you can dehydrate, but there are, other, there are some things that are more optimal than others. So you can see here all kinds of palm fruits, apples, peaches, pears, cherries, grapes, all of those kinds of things. But blackberries are not as good. Now think about, um, all the seeds and blackberries. They're a little bit more thicker. There's more of them than something like a raspberry. So once that gets concentrated, it's not, you're not going to have that really uh, as good of a texture because of all those seeds and you can't take those out. Uh, things like vegetables also, you're going to get, you're going to have great product from beets, cabbage, carrots, garlic, um, those kinds of things for soups but maybe not so much um, lettuce and uh, radishes, things that have a lot of water in them. 
And if you think about how you might use them, you're just not gonna get a lot of flavor and maybe not a lot of other uses for that, those kinds of vegetables. Now you can also use uh, a dehydrator for making things like beef jerky. So it's fantastic. Um, I just made some earlier this week for class. It turned out so well. And I do have some slides ahead of time to talk you through that prospect, process specifically. So we'll get to that. Um, but you can also use game meats with, uh, with making jerky as well with some special considerations. Now, fruit leathers is great. We always say in food preservation, you really wanna start with the highest quality product. Uh, you want to make sure that nothing is bruised, um, but fruit leathers is one of those exceptions where if you've got maybe some imperfect fruit, this is a great opportunity for that because you are going to be blending it and then dehydrating it. So you're not gonna have the same kind of you know, product quality issues that you might have in something like, um, I'm looking over here, my my packages that I have like with apples or pears or other kinds of fruit like berries. Herbs are also a fantastic thing to dehydrate. Um, you can use it in a dehydrator and there's also other options which we'll talk about as well in a few slides. Now, think about what you are interested in dehydrating and the different categories of foods that are within that. So you do need, need to consider when you are making things like fruits, that you should be pre-treating it with an acidic solution dip. Now, fruits are already considered acidic, but adding that solution to it is going to prevent darkening. It's going to speed up drying. It's going to inhibit growth of microorganisms if they're present. And overall, it's going to give you, I think, a better quality product. Now, you can see here, I've got some pears. Hopefully, you can see that. They're a little bit darker and I've got some apples as well. Now, I don't know the specifics of, so one of my master food safety advisors made this. Um, you can see how nice and light the apples are. There's no discoloration to that. Um, and I'm gonna assume that she did do an acid dip on that. If you don't do a pre-treating solution and you're wanting to make a fruit that you're gonna eat very quickly, it's not gonna be stored for a long time, um, you can do that. Um, just know that it will get a little bit browner and that it's not going to last as long. I think though, uh, pre-treating fruit with acidic solution is really great because it actually enhances the flavor of the fruit. So if you're interested, give it a try side by side. If you're going to do an apple, maybe try an apple without it and try an apple with it. And you might be pleasantly surprised how that pre-treatment really affects the flavor and the quality. So that's for fruit. On the other hand, we have blanching. So blanching slows and stops enzyme growth, which deteriorates our product. It also helps maintain uh, flavor and texture, and it also destroys microorganisms. So it's very important in that process as well. And then we'll talk about the different varieties. So for fruit and preparing for drying, you always wanna make sure that you've got the best quality product as you can get. You want to wash the fruit and drain it thoroughly and then peel, slice, or cut it into similar sizes for even drying. So think that through a little bit. You wouldn't want uneven slices of your product because it's going to dehydrate un unevenly. So some may take several hours longer to fully dehydrate if they're in consistent thickness. And then you also want to make sure that your product is fairly, uh, doesn't have water beading on it when you put it on the dehydrator. You wanna maybe just blot it with a paper towel um, after you've prepared it so it's not dripping wet when it goes into the dehydrator. Now, there are a couple different uh, treatments for uh, fruit that you can see listed here. So we've got lemon juice, citric acid, and ascorbic acid. My favorite actually is the lemon juice. Um, you're not supposed to use fresh lemon juice because we don't um, always know the pH balance of that. Um, but for this treatment, that bottled lemon juice is a great product to use. And you don't really have to remember a formula. All it is is equal parts lemon juice and water. You cut up your fruit or you wash your fruit, you cut it up, and then you just soak it in for 10 minutes um, in that lemon juice um, concentration and then drain it thoroughly and it's ready to go on the, to the trays. You can also use citric acid um, with a solution there you can see, and then ascorbic acid. You can purchase a commercial ascorbic acid, or you can even just crush 
vitamin C tablets. And then you also have a solution, um, two and a half tablespoons in one quart of water. Um, so you'll have to remember that part of it to be able to make that solution. Now with vegetables, because they're not already acidic, you don't need to do an acidic solution. You can, if you want to, some people do, but it's not necessarily the number one requirement. Um, what you should and is recommended is blanching your produce. Now, again, you'll wanna make sure everything is in great condition. Um, you'll need to wash everything to remove the dirt and then peel, trim, core, cut, slice or shred, whatever you're, you're processing, making sure you have that uniform size um, to get ready for the dehydrator. Now, what you're gonna do if you've never done blanching before is you're going to prepare a boiling water bath or a boiling water pot on the stove that um, you will dunk your sliced and you know, pre-measured amounts and pre-measured vegetable into that boiling water for 30 seconds to anywhere from two minutes, depending on what it is. And then you use a colander or a cheesecloth to get that out. Um, and then you put it into an ice water bath to stop that cooking process. And what that does is it washes off any you know, uh, remaining dirt. It destroys microorganisms. It slows and stops that enzyme activity. It gives you a superior flavor, color, texture um, that you wouldn't if you didn't do that. Um, and if you are interested, I am throughout this process going to be talking about these steps, but I will put in the chat box, we have specific fact sheets for each of these processes through CSU that will give you step-by-step -step instructions. And then we also have a chart that shows you the different requirements of blanching or the acidifying solution for different fruits and vegetables. So I won't leave you hanging today. I'll make sure that you get that information before we leave um, and you'll be able to use that for your projects moving forward. Now, once you've got your product on your uh, dehydrator and it's ready to um, pull off, there are different things that you can look for in whether or not it seems like it's done. So again, those fact sheets will give you specific times or a range of time. So for instance, I believe, I may not have, be able to pull this from memory very well, but something like an apple, um, you will need to dry for maybe six to 10 hours, don't quote me, um, but that's the general recommendation. So you can see that down below. It's a little bit different for fruits than it is for vegetables. But the type of food, the size of food, its moisture content, the drier temperature, and the relative humidity can all factor in to how soon, how quickly your food and how well it dehydrated, dehydrates. Now think back also to those two different dehydrator models that I showed you earlier. They're different brands. They have different wattages on them. I have uh, I'm very certain that not all dehydrators have the same power available to them. And even if a dehydrator says that it's, you know, at 150 degrees, it may be a little bit off. And the one that I use this week, I have several um, in my office. I felt just like it, it just seemed like it ran a little bit hotter than the actual temperature gave me. So if you're able to make it a, to test it like you would with your oven, I would recommend doing that. And if you've had a dehydrator for a while, you know, maybe it's just not as accurate as it used to be. So really get used to the temp to your dehydrating unit, do small batches to start kind of get a feel for how it works, the way that you, the thickness that you like, they are recommendations for thickness, but you may like something a little bit thinner or a little bit thicker, depending on what you're using it for um, and how, you know, the texture and the quality that you like. So it really is, um, a, a practice. I would say um, there's a lot, there is variability. I'm giving you general recommendations, but knowing how you like to do it um, with your specific dehydrator um, is important to find out. And that's really, you know, that goes for cooking also. You can take general recommendations and then make some changes that work for you. With dehydrating, you can have a little bit of that variability. Other things like water bath canning and um, pressure canning, you really do have to follow to the exact T to make sure that you're getting a food safe quality, um, food safe product. Now, with that, um, it's recommended that vegetables be brittle or leathery. 
Um, and then you can see the definitions here. Leathery really means pliable, um, spring back, it folded. So something um, that might look like that is, I've got my vegetables out here. I've got some uh, little chips here. I'm gonna turn on my camera so I can see. You've got, this is a vegetable chip. Now you might be able to hear it snap. So it is a little bit brittle um, to it. It's got some, it's, it's, it's funny because it kind of does both. There is some crunch to it, but there also is some bend to it as well. And then with fruit, it should be pliable and leather-like. There should be no pockets of moisture. And you know, in the store, you can get commercial products that can range from something. So this is an apple I've got here. It's a very flexible. So it's gonna be very chewy, uh, but you can get things in the grocery store that are like apple chips, which actually do crunch. So you can make that variability. So this is safe, this is dehydrated. There's no pockets of moisture in it. It's a really great product. It's gonna last a long time. However, if you did wanna take it a further step to make it crisp like a chip, you could experiment with that as well. And I feel like pears also are very similar to apples. Um, but I think even, you know, the grainy quality of pears um, makes them extra uh, flexible as well. And I have taken pears to chip, um, I would say the chip stage, um, and I didn't like them as much as they are bendable because it's really just that grainy quality in a pear really will kind of make it hard to chew, almost like a, a tough jerky. <laughs> so experiment and see what you like the best. All right, so the last step of the dehydrating process is conditioning. So if you are going to be storing this product for a little bit longer than a couple of weeks, um, I would highly recommend conditioning it um, so that it has a better shelf quality to it, shelf life. So all that you're doing is putting your food in a tightly closed, closed container and then shaking it or stirring it every day to equalize that moisture. If at that point in time, it seems a little bit too moist, you are welcome to return that to the dehydrator for further dehydrating. Sometimes it can be really hard to tell if something is ready or not um, when it's warm. So you have to pull it off the dehydrator, let it cool down a little bit, and then you'll know what that product is going to be like. And sometimes it can be hard to do that. So conditioning is a really great way to um, make sure that you're getting a good product. Now. There are some, uh, I would say, conditions that will cause case hardening if you've not heard of that. And what that means is that the outside of the food cooks, leaving moisture inside. So it creates like a barrier on the outside that moisture is not able to get out of. And you've got those moisture pockets trapped inside and that can cause mold later on. And really what happens is if you're dehydrating at too high of a temperature, um, you're, you might see that. So if the 10 hours is just not going to work for you and you're trying to make it dehydrate faster by increasing the recommended temperature time, this is something that you're probably going to experience. So low and slow really is the game for dehydrating and having a really high quality product. Um, so it really is recommended that you use that temperature um, as recommended, otherwise you may get like a failure in your product. Now, as with everything in food preservation, make sure that you're labeling, you're dating it and storing it in a cool, dry, dark place for optimal storage. Um, and then you can use freezer safe containers um, as well as other containers like glass jars um, for like mason jars that can uh, seal very tightly, um, Ziploc bags, or um, vacuum packaging is a really great option as well if you have a vacuum sealer. And then with food dehydration, six months to a year um, is the best recommendation. If you go beyond that, it's not going to spoil right away, but you will maybe start to see some de deterioration in the quality of the product. Now, on to drying herbs. This is one of my actual, this is my favorite. <laughs> I always say it's my favorite. I have a lot of different food preservation favorites, but I really do love drying herbs because it is so simple. 
And the herbs that you can grow in your garden and use all winter long are just incomparable, I think, to what you can get in the store as with, you know, gardening for a lot of other things. <laughs> so for air drying or sturdy herbs, such as rosemary, sage, and thyme, you can see some are savory and parsley. Um, these are the easiest things that you can do without a dehydrator. Now I've got a great little picture here of small bundles. You can hang them up in a place where they're not gonna be exposed to pollution or fumes. So think of maybe like a guest bedroom or somewhere in the basement that's out of the way, but it's not like in a closet. It needs to have some good air circulation. I would say no more than five or six stems at a time, uh, maybe eight, but maybe that's you know pushing it a little bit. You can use a rubber band or you can use just a little string, make that nice and tight because that will shrink up a little bit when you put it in those bundles. Um, and it can take you maybe three to six days for those to dry. It doesn't take a long time. Um, and this is a great thing as we're going into the holiday season. I can't believe that. I just said that. It's already that time of year. Um, if you don't have a garden, but you love you know, herbs and you want to get the freshest that you can around the holidays, you'll often see those clamshells of fresh herbs on sale, a really great sale. Um, so things like rosemary, sage, and thyme is like a poultry blend. Um, you can get those for a great price and then you can dehydrate them and then use them throughout the winter for cooking. And I have done that multiple times when I didn't have a garden available to me. And it's a great way to do it. Now, things like tender leaf herbs, such as basil, oregano, tarragon, uh, mint, and lemon balm have more moisture in them and they'll mold if they're not dried quickly. So you can uh, hang dry these in a bag um, to encourage grow, uh, encourage dehydrating. You can even poke some holes in the bags um, so that they're contained. And then if you've got the herbs that have the seeds on them, say you're harvesting your garden at the end of the year, put them in the bag upside down, and then any of the seeds that are there will get caught so that you can use those for later on. Now, this is even an easier method, which I use frequently. <laughs> so I mentioned earlier, I do have a toddler and any shortcut I can make, um, I am all about it um, with cooking. So I do have a tray just, you know, just a size, you can harvest a few herbs at a time. Or if you harvested more than what your recipe said and you're not sure what to do with it, just wash them, put them on a tray like this, put them out of the way, and leave them for four to six days, typically in my home environment, and they will dry and they are good and ready to go for future use. So simple. You just don't wanna overcrowd that tray. You can also use a dehydrator. You don't have to, but it's fast and easy as well. And you have to set, you can set that temperature. So most dehydrating herb recipes will tell you to use something at the lowest temperature possible um, with your dehydrator, and that's usually between 85 and 95 degrees. So you can see here, you've got a whole tray of basil and that's what that would look like. Now, when you're ready to use the dehydrator for herbs, just wanna make sure that you are washing them first um, under cool running water, shake them off to remove any excess moisture. If you wanna blot them with a, like a, a tea towel, you're absolutely welcome to do that. Um, it's probably a better option to do that. And then your drying times are going to be a lot shorter because they're just not as, um, as not as thick. So about one to four hours. And then you'll know they're ready when they crumble and then the stems will break um, apart when they are bent. And with that, um, you also should be storing your herbs in airtight containers, have them labeled and dated, and then mm, as with spices, herbs are going to retain the most flavor if you store them whole and then crush them when you're ready to use. So some people use herbs and spices so you know religiously that they don't buy ground um, herbs and spices, only the whole form, because you will get so much more flavor um, if you leave that whole and then grind it when you're ready. And the, just those aromatic oils will just wake up and it'll just be fantastic. Um, one of my favorite things to do with the dried herbs that I store 
is I will, so something like um, rosemary, thyme, sage. I think those are the three that I predominantly use. And I have different, several different varieties of those in my it's a very small garden, but I packed it in as much as I can. I'll dehydrate it on a tray. And then I will break off the leaves, the whole leaves, like a sage leaf or rosemary from that stem. And I'll store the stems in the dried ones in a mason jar for later on. And then anytime a recipe calls for a bay leaf or anytime I make soup or stock where I might use a bay leaf, I will open up that jar of that stem, the sage stem, the rosemary stem, the thyme stems, and I'll throw a few of those in the soup or the broth and get the flavor out of those and then pull those with the bay leaf um, at the end. And it's just fantastic. Um, so you're not even wasting that part of it. Um, it's just so much flavor um, that's still available to you. So if you have any mold that does grow on it because you didn't, they weren't dried well enough, um, unfortunately, that's not something that we could recommend that you can come back from. That's something that just needs to get, um, that, to get uh, discarded. Okay, now on to fruit leathers. So again, you do have access to those fact sheets that will give you step-by-step -step instructions um, on how to do that. Um, but we also have a very shortened version of that here. So you can wash, pit, and core your fruit, uh, cook it until it's soft, then you put it in the fruit blender, adding some kind of acidic solution so that it doesn't you know, brown, that it keeps a good quality to it. You can add sweetener, you can add spices, um, if you like as well. And then you line your dehydrator tray um, with that leather. So you can use plastic wrap or you can spray your dehydrator tray with um, like a vegetable spray. I don't have any spray cans at home, but I just used a, like a little paper towel and lined it with some uh, grapeseed oil, which is a neutral oil and uh, spread it out on the fruit evenly. Um, up to a quarter inch thick, dehydrate it for four to 10 hours. And then when it's done, it will easily peel. So I had one of those big round ones, a full solid tray, and I just lifted it off and the whole thing came off beautifully. And I had showed you earlier, for those of you that might've been um, after when I just start, first started chatting, um, you could do it with the fruit that you have, but there's also a shortcut method which is um, on part of your fact sheet where you can actually just use the product, something like this, like a baby food. This is pear, purple carrot, and blueberry. So if you want a shortcut method or just want to maybe try a fruit leather for the first time without going through the full effort of cooking it down, um, blending it, adding the, you know, the, the additive to it so that it doesn't brown, um, you might just try one of these first. Um, just to see how it goes. Now I use two of these. So this is four ounces for one tray and it ended up being um, very thin. So, and it was fine, it, you know, it's still bendable. I don't know if you can see this. Um, it's very, very thin. Just, I would say just about paper thin. You can, if I turn it just the right way, you really can't see it at all. Um, but it still has a really great texture overall to it. You probably could do, so this is eight ounces. This is a, so a cup for per tray. You could probably do at least another four to eight ounces to get it to that quarter inch thick, which would give you a probably more consistent um, or similar product to the kinds of fruit leathers in the individual packages that you can get in the store um, that are you know a little rectangle that are a lot thicker. So do some experimenting to see what you like the best. Okay. Now, when you're storing it, all you need to do is just roll that fruit leather up into plastic wrap or wax paper, put it in a plastic or glass container um, and make sure that it's completely dry. And then again, you can store that in a cool, dry, dark place for a couple months or in the refrigerator or up to a freezer for a year. So depending on how fast you go through them or how fast your family does, um, you can definitely put them under refrigeration or freezing to extend that life a little bit longer. Or if you just want to put it away for later on so you have a snack um, whenever you want it, um, that's an option for you. So some inspiration, if you've not thought through this before, um, a tomato leather, uh, salsa leather, 
um, mixed vegetable leather, pumpkin, yogurt, and fruit. Um, these are all really great options that are so much fun to play with. I've tasted a salsa leather before. Someone made their own salsa, they blended it, they put it in that leather form, and then they use that to um, uh, flavor soups later on. So there are a lot of options. If we're right in the that part of the season where the tomatoes are um, just amazing right now, available, um, and that's something else you can do with your tomatoes besides what you currently do. Now, here's the last part of the presentation. So we're in, we have about, um, about 10 minutes or so left. So we'll be able to get through this. Um, if you're interested in drying jerky, um, there is a fact sheet on that that's available to you. Um, there's a couple of things that you do need to consider. So you don't wanna have a fatty cut of, of meat here um, because that fat can become rancid. And that's really just an undesirable thing for any kind of food that we eat, um, especially if you're going to be storing it for a little bit longer. Now, um, you will get step-by-step -step instructions in that fact sheet, but just a short little you know, preview is uh, you might freeze that meat, um, not until it's solid, but enough that it gets a little bit harder and easier to cut. Uh, you, and then when that's ready, you can slice that no thicker than a quarter inch, and depending on if you'd rather have chewy jerky or a little bit more uh, brittle jerky, you can slice with the grain or across the grain. You can also flatten the strips with a rolling pin to create a, as best a even consistency or um, thickness as possible. Now CSU does recommend that you follow tested recipes for things um, for curing or marinating. Um, the thing about beef jerky that we really have to be careful about is that if you're doing this, um, dehydrators don't reach a high enough temperature to kill harmful bacteria. So that really is the risk that you're running um, if you're making beef jerky at home. So things like salmonella and E. coli are very real um, issues that you may face when trying to do this at home if you're not doing it correctly. Uh, so what we recommend, USDA recommends, is pre-cooking the meat in a marinade or soaking it in vinegar for 10 minutes. Um, and those, both of those act as a, an antimicrobial treatment um, before you um, dehydrate, okay? Now there's a few other steps that go with this. If So we recommend two different recipes. We have them listed out for you. So one of them is a hot pickle cure. And so you are going to cure the meat with salt and sugar and pepper, um, press it into the meat, refrigerate it for 24 hours, and then you combine ingredients for a brine. You bring it to a boil, um, you let it simmer for two minutes, and then you're ready to put that meat on clean dehydrating trays and ready for dehydrating. This one is no cook method, but what you're doing is you are soaking the uh, meat in a pre-treatment solution of vinegar for 10 minutes. Once that's done, you drain the meat out and then you put it in a marinade. And again, there's a recipe available to you. I think it's um, soy sauce, Worcestershire sauce, and then some, I think, garlic powder, onion powder, black pepper, and a little bit of salt is the one that I used earlier this week. It's gone. It's delicious. <laughs> um, the class enjoyed it last night and we ate all of it. I ended up, the recipe is for two pounds and I ended up just getting a little eight ounce, a really nice um, eight ounce cut of something that had a nice thickness to it. And so I had nice even slices and it was just a great size. Um, so Obviously you don't have to do two pounds at a time if you don't want to. Um, so then you refrigerate it for 24 hours in a marinade. And then you, once 24 hours is up, you can go up to 24 hours. You can go anywhere from one to 24 hours to marinade for flavor. But the vinegar soak is taking care of that antimicrobial um, need for this. Then you put it on the meat dehydrator um, on the trays to dehydrate, okay? Now, when you're drying that jerky, make sure that it's not overlapping. So it's getting a nice, even uh, airflow around it. And you're going to want to use about 145 degrees for 10 to 14 hours. Um, and then with anything that you dehydrate, you need to let it cool a little bit so that you know um, 
how, if it's done or not before, you just don't want to pull it off hot to understand how, where it's at in its process. You let it cool down a little bit. Okay. Now um, it should be chewy and leathery. If you have any oil beading on it, you can just put that, pat that off. You shouldn't have any issues beyond that. And then you want to condition your jerky, just like we talked about before with the other processes, shaking it up, redistributing that moisture, and then placing it in an airtight container, labeling it, like we said. Um, and then you can go room temperature for about two weeks, refrigerated three to six months, or frozen up to a year. And then again, you can see I have a photo here of that vacuum seal is a really great way to um, store it as well. Now, this also is a question that we often get. Can I make, make a jerky from ground meat? You can. However, there are some things that you really need to consider before you try this. And one of that is because ground meat has so much more surface area. It's not just a flat slice. You know, you've got like the ground, it's all in there. You are going to have more opportunities for microorganisms to grow. It's a little bit more difficult to eliminate that those microorganisms in ground meat because of that surface area. So you don't marinate uh, ground meat, but you mix it with dry spices and a nitrate cure. And then you form those strips into, or you, this is a turkey gun, for example, that you see here. This was a lab tested at CSU in the nutrition department. Um, you could use that turkey gun to spread out the exact thickness and the exact width of, you know, of the size of jerky, then you cook that for 160 degrees um, for 10 minutes, and then you can put it on the dehydrator, okay? And that cooking is going to get rid of any of those microorganisms that grow um, the potential, you know, to make you sick, okay? Now, I wanted to talk about also, just this is our last slide, um, we just don't want to dehydrate certain things. So, it's possible to dehydrate, dehydrate these foods, but what's problematic is that it puts them in the potentially hazardous or the temperature zone, uh, which is called um, the, the, the danger zone basically in food safety is between 100 or excuse me, 41 degrees and 135 degrees. And that is when bacterial growth grows exponentially. And having food in that range that's not specifically tested with the kind of foods that we're talking about can really um, be a dangerous thing for bacterial growth. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, it's just not recommended um, that we try these kinds of things at home, okay? Now, we are at the end of the presentation. Um, we're at our 45 minutes. And so what I'm gonna do is go ahead and stop the recording. And then I do have some questions that I see. So thank you for joining today. If you do need to leave, um, thank you for joining. I am going to put one more time in the chat. I'm gonna stop the recording. Thanks again.